Pat, longtime friend of Nunkatuck. Welcome, Sean, and you may share your screen. Okay, well, welcome everybody. Thanks for coming and thank you, Dennis, for asking me to do this today. I'm gonna share my PowerPoint and hopefully everybody can see that. So as Dennis mentioned, um, I'm from the McKinney National Wildlife Refuge, which I'll talk to you a little bit about um, before we get into the meat of the presentation about salt marsh haymaking. Um, first of all, many people in Connecticut don't really know what a National Wildlife Refuge is. I'm assuming many of the people on this uh, Zoom meeting do, but I always like to tell audiences about National Wildlife Refuges because they are pretty special areas um, that the government has set aside to protect native wildlife plants um, and to benefit not only us, but future generations. They're very similar to national parks, but the emphasis really is on the animals and plants that live in them, not so much on scenery or recreation. Um, or other things, although they are beautiful uh, and you can recreate at them, uh, most of them anyway. Uh, and this idea, this whole idea uh, comes from the people of the early 20th century, including uh, Theodore Roosevelt, our conservation president, who decided to set aside uh, Pelican Island way back in 1903. Um, and that little refuge that started in Florida became about 560 refuges across the country. There are 150 million acres protected now um, across the United States just for wildlife and for people to visit again. So these are pretty cool places. All the pictures that I'm showing you here are from different parts of our refuge in Connecticut. Uh, the McKinney Refuge stretches about 70 miles across the coast. We're based in Westbrook, so um, very close to the Clinton Outlets and Lenny and Joe's is about 350 acres of marsh and forest, uh, about half of which you can walk through on trails. And it has some cool stuff to see, including this time of the year, Ibis. Uh, and herons and, and other uh, long-legged waders that live on the island, um, Nunkatesic, that's just off the coast. And then we have Faulkner Island, this tiny little dot on the screen that usually has about 6,000 birds that all cram onto the island and reproduce this time of the year, including roseate terns, which are endangered. We have Outer Island in the Thimbles, the only publicly available uh, island that you can visit in the thimbles is outer and it's pretty neat. It's a small island, but there are a lot of micro habitats. Then we're all the way down uh, the coast with some other neat properties, including um, great meadows in Stratford, very close to Sikorsky Airport, um, and then the Norwalk Islands, Calf Island, and Greenwich. So most of these places are open, um, and you can contact me or look at our website if you want a lot more information about those places. So what we do at the refuge um, can be summed up in, in really two things, um, conserving wildlife, especially at risk species. Um, in kind of the middle of the screen, you see what our marsh in, in, at Salt Meadow and Westbrook can look like. Um, so that's picture of uh, ibis and herons there. And then us taking people out into the marsh on a kayak tour um, that we usually do in September. We haven't done that with COVID, but I want to bring that back this year. So we'll probably have that. And there are some other pictures of um, our interns monitoring birds, removing invasive species on um, our barrier beach, closing off the beaches to um, allow for nesting and, and doing all kinds of different studies. So that's what we try to do, um, study uh, our refuge and make it better habitat for animals and welcome people to it. So it's a neat place to work and I really enjoy it. And I enjoy doing programs like this um, 
that talk a little bit about the habitats that I get to experience, and probably you, most of you do as well, um, getting outdoors as much as you can. So let's talk a little bit about what a salt marsh actually is. Um, so salt marshes here, getting back to the very basics, form where rivers, in other words, fresh water, meet the sea, uh, salty water. In our case, it's the sound. So it's already, um, you know, it's a smaller body of water, but these marshes are just as important, not always as big as other states have them in Connecticut but very important and unique habitats. Um, and really the, the hatchery, the incubator for a lot of uh, animals that have just been born. And they're more protected areas where um, wildlife will, will often go to reproduce. So there's a lot of life in there um, that people may not realize unless they spend time in the marsh. They're also really beneficial for us because they, in times of storms, they'll, they'll often absorb a lot of uh, the storm surge. Uh, so water um, and other flooding can get absorbed pretty easily by the marsh. And even with spills or other things like that or pollutants um, in any of the water that touches the marsh, the marsh will often uh, take that in, so other habitats are not affected by that. Um, and then obviously recreation um, can take place in a lot of our marshes as well, paddling, photography, things like that. So they're really unique habitats. Uh, Connecticut is, is one of the lucky states to have uh, wetlands that include salt marshes. And for those of you who've spent some time in our marshes, you might recognize some of these species. Um, so starting at the top left is great blue heron, a uh, very familiar species of the marsh and other wetlands. And then you have something that's not so familiar, that flower, the pink flower. So that's called salt marsh pink or marsh pink. And actually, our marsh in Great Meadows, um, Stratford, is the only place that it still exists in Connecticut. So it's a rare plant, uh, and you may have heard about a big restoration that's going on there right now. Um, and part of the restoration is to restore higher marsh where plants like this will live and hopefully thrive there. Uh, then we've got some snowy egrets, a pair of them standing next to each other in the marsh and then uh, a kingfisher below them, diamondback terrapin that nests just above the marsh uh, and spends a lot of its time in those waters um, because it's the, the only turtle that really lives in that area. They're either sea turtles or freshwater turtles except for the diamondback which lives uh, in these brackish waters. And then we've got a glossy ibis up close um, which usually on the refuge can be found in Westbrook, but sometimes we have them in other places as well. Uh, and you'll see them, of course, at Hammond Asset, places like that where people take pictures all the time of them. So this is a, um, an illustration of different parts of the marsh. So people who aren't too familiar kind of look at it and they see a lot of grass, but not necessarily honing in on a lot of other things. Um, so all the way um, on the one side with the blue crab on the bottom, that's the lower marsh there um, that's basically wet uh, almost all the time. And then you move into um, the low marsh where there, there's salt pans. And then farther along, um, you get high marsh, which is what we're gonna be focusing on basically today. Um, and then farther, you get more things where there's high tide bush and then upland. Um, so there are many, many uh, sections to these marshes uh, and lots of different species that live within those sections that you can see illustrated here. All right, so this is the dominant plant in of the low marsh, and I'm just going to try to move this out of the way. 
This is Spartina alterniflora. Um, it's taller. And this is the part of the marsh, obviously, that's that's muddy most of the time. You're, you're not going to walk around in this unless you have uh, hip boots, uh, really good boots on. Um, and you can see this. This is where um, these channels are. And this is flooded quite a bit of the time. Um, so Spartina alterniflora was sometimes used by um, people as fodder for animals and, and other things, um, bedding for animals. But the species that we're going to focus on mainly is something called Spartina patens. And that's what this is that you can see on the screen. This is the by far the dominant plant in a healthy high marsh. Uh, there are other plants like uh, sea lavender and other things that you'll see growing within this. But the patents here is what you see most of. And this is what our salt marsh haymakers are really interested in. Um, so sometimes this sticks straight up, um, but oftentimes you'll see it in what people call cowlicks, uh, these kind of swirls. Um, I wouldn't have even known what that was, but I when I was a, a little kid, my, my grandparents always referred to the hair that stuck up on the back of my head as a cowlick. Um, and that's what, that's what these, these are sometimes called. Uh, this is much shorter than the other marsh grass. So it's usually about six inches, but it can get up to about two feet tall. And this is really the prize of the marsh if you are a farmer anyway. So, we talked about Native Americans that lived in this area um, when Dennis started the program. And there were certainly many tribes, and they spent a lot of time in the marsh gathering um, shellfish and finfish, and also probably plants um, that they, they may have used for medicine or other purposes. But we don't have any evidence, um, and it seems to make sense that they didn't actually use the marsh hay for much of anything. They, they may have used it in some of their dwellings and things like that. But the big difference between Native Americans and Europeans in the utilization of these marshes is that when Europeans come, they have livestock, and they want to feed that livestock and give the livestock bedding. Um, so here you can see one of the, it's um, a 20th century representation, but the top image there is basically a European um, in purchasing uh, land in Norwalk um, from Native Americans when they were uh, negotiating that in the 1640s. Um, so a lot of that actually was uh, negotiations over things like islands and marshes because um, believe it or not, these people were very interested in that for farming purposes. So these are pictures from um, a National Park Service farm, Living History Museum that you can go to, uh, just to illustrate the point uh, from that time period. But these early European settlers needed the, um, or made use of marsh hay for cattle feed, that was number one. A lot of people um, actually noted that uh, animals preferred the salt hay rather than hay that was grown in a field. Um, and we're not exactly sure why. It could have been because of the salt content, and it could have differed from you know one herd of cattle, one farm to the next. But farmers really loved it because the stuff was free, uh, and they didn't have to cultivate it. They also used it for bedding, um, as I mentioned. And strangely enough, we wouldn't think of it necessarily, but they used it for um, insulating their homes. So as an early insulation in their homes, not necessarily the barn, um, but their own dwellings. And also for uh, packaging things up. So a lot of these farmers would have been uh, craftsmen as well. They might have created ceramic items um, or any kind of thing that they wanted to protect. So they would put that in crates um, and use salt hay to cushion it 
when they um, put it on a wagon and shift it off somewhere or on a, uh, a boat. So there are many uses. There were also many challenges um, to the farmers who used these places so that the stuff is free um, and you don't have to take care of it. But the challenges are obviously that marshes are tidal. So you don't have to worry about the tide as much as if you were um, doing things in the low marsh um, because this is high marsh, but still um, this stuff grows there because it gets flooded with brackish or salt water um, pretty often. So you have to time your harvest around that. Um, marshes are obviously not solid ground. You can see it's one of the many studies that we do um, includes taking samples of what the marsh looks like, what it's made out of. So you can see our biologist there in the photo showing a core sample from one of our marshes. And you can see um, basically it's just decomposed plants. Um, that's very spongy. Uh, there isn't dirt there really. Um, there aren't any rocks to make it solid uh, in most cases. So it's just dead plant material that you're standing on. So it's like a sponge in a lot of cases. Uh, and then obviously I don't even mention it here, but there are challenges too, depending on when you harvest uh, the salt hay. There are references to beginning harvests in July. Um, so if any of you have ever gone into a salt marsh in July, at least in the 21st century, um, you will get inundated by mosquitoes in a lot of places. So they're, they're not the most comfortable places to do uh, farming, but people really were interested in it anyway. So they, they overcame those challenges. Um, one way that Europeans um, made marshes a little bit more comfortable, a little bit more efficient for them was by actually reclaiming um, parts of the marsh and digging ditches or creating uh, dikes like you see here. So this is a, an illustration from Holland and very big and elaborate. Um, and as far as I know, nothing in Connecticut ever existed like this, but they did have some substantial dikes. Um, and this, was, this had already, this technique had already existed for a couple hundred years um, before Europeans start doing it here in North America. So it is a practice. All these things have mostly disappeared now, unless you know what to look for. There still is evidence of um, these early manipulations in the marsh. Um, and we'll talk about 20th century stuff later, but this is early stuff that they did to try to make the marsh um, more efficient for harvesting this salté. This is actually an example of, um, so this is Great Meadows in Stratford. Um, the marsh was originally um, over a thousand acres. We don't know exactly how big it was. It has shrunk today. Um, but it's still about 650 acres and the refuge protects about 425 of those acres. So it's significant, but it has some scars in it basically. Um, if you can see my cursor or uh, right in the middle of this picture, basically there's the remnants of a dike that was built, I believe in the early 20th century there. Um, it's a, an irregular shape it's broken up, but it still does affect the marsh. And when it was totally intact, um, you could see that it would have, would have held back water uh, in many cases to create whatever effect. Um, certainly this may not have been for salt hang, although a lot of that was done here, but um, things just like this would have been built by the farmers to do that um, so they could harvest better. This is another uh, image from Great Meadows. We don't know the exact date, but you can see telephone poles here. So it's early 20th century, uh, maybe the teens or the 20s. And you can see the dirt road through the, the high marsh there. And obviously huge piles of salt hay all along the road for miles. 
And that's what this was used for for many, many years. Um, that eventually changed, um, but it was, it was used like that for a long time. Here's a video, I'm gonna show part of this. Um, and this is actually a reenactment that was done in Massachusetts, um, which is still the only place that they actively do this. So let's see the video, just a portion of it. There is some audio that will come on. You should be hearing a little bit of it now. So this was in September of 2009. And this is up in Newberry. And these are some of the families who have done this for generations, still doing it. But here you can see the gentleman moving the uh, hay with, with poles. Um, where they're going to stack it up. we did to start was just start laying hay on the top of those poles. That way, as you pick up a pile, what we did in the beginning was use the poles or a fork, either one, but you want a large enough, well, almost a pancake, if you will, of hay that will set on top of those poles. You don't want a, a little bunch of hay that will wind up falling down between the poles. So that's how you have to get it started. Then after we were up a couple of feet, uh, we got somebody up on the stack and, and started, as we say, laying the stack. Laying the stack is stacking the hay where you want it on the pile in order to keep a good shape and uh, also in uh, compressing it down. A lot of it is just simply walking around up there and, and treading everything down, packing it down as you go. We want it as tightly compressed as we can so that it will not absorb water, but the rainwater and snow will basically run off. Okay. So he explained there that they use poles uh, most of the time, uh, a lot of poles used in this to move the hay over to um, poles that they've stuck into the marsh um, where it's gonna remain pretty dry most of the time. And then they form a pancake at the bottom. Um, and then they, they refer to laying the stack. So somebody will be up top and basically that person will be receiving the hay from all these other people that bring it. And he's gonna go around, compress it down and form that cone. Um, and these were referred to as uh, staddles. So before I researched this, I had no idea that, that these existed or what they were called or what the purpose of them was. So you can see the hay staddle in the marsh there in the postcard on the bottom. But these staddles are actually a pretty ancient way of storing any kind of grain or food stuff. Um, so the other picture there is from England. And you can see that they've created these um, rocks that kind of look like mushrooms. So there are rocks sticking out of the ground and then um, a top there. And that little storage facility is held above the earth to keep it 
drier um, and maybe keep uh, vermin and other things from going in there. So the logs that they use for these staddles, both of them can be referred to like that, um, are either ash or in our case, more often cedar, you know, cedar trees growing along the shoreline. They don't rot, um, so they would stick those in there um, to resist uh, any kind of decay. And then sometimes they would lay cord grass, that stuff that grows in the, the muddy lower part of the marsh on the bottom just to form a layer. And then all the good stuff would be on top. Um, this was often a communal event um, where families would, would come together and do this, or even neighbors. Um, and that cone shape is to shed water or even snow if you're gonna leave the stuff there, you know, you harvest it in September, you leave it there, it snows, but you, you wanna come back to a stack and get, get the hay later. Um, that design is to keep it from rotting and getting uh, too wet or anything like that. These are some awesome still images uh, that I borrowed from a historical society up in New Hampshire. Um, my favorite picture in this whole presentation is the one on my right side there um, of the, the farmer handing up some of the hay on top of the stack. And there's two things that I love about it. Um, if you look at the farmer suspenders there and his shirt, you can tell that he's absolutely filthy and he doesn't care at all. Um, and I think that people were, were used to being really dirty um, and just not, not caring. And also, if you look at the seat of his pants, um, there was no fast fashion back then. Uh, and these were a lot of homemade things that you really wore until they were worn out. Um, so these are real images of Americana from days gone by, the way people used to do things that we've kind of lost touch with. Um, but you can see the, the haystacks forming there and how they would do it. They would use, uh, in addition to their neighbors and family and the kids, they would use their animals to help in harvesting too. Um, and this was done in areas where it was easy to take the animals and you weren't gonna to worry too much about them. Um, you know, being in, in soggy places where their feet were going to sink in. And also they used those special horseshoes, um, which they called bog or swamp horseshoes um, to walk around in the, in the marsh. Um, so they're basically like big snowshoes or something that you would put on if you were going uh, snowshoeing, you didn't want to sink into the snow. Same concept, obviously, for your animals. They used horses and sometimes oxen to do this. Um, and all the harvesting was done by hand in the beginning, but then sometimes if, if you had a good spot, again, you would take in some lighter equipment, like um, the picture on the left shows a farmer with some equipment there that could harvest. Um, without worrying about that sinking in or you losing it to the marsh. Um, but most of this was actually done by hand. Um, so a lot of hard work. They also use specialized uh, boats, which again, before I researched this, I had never heard of these, but they are called gundalos. And these are two pictures, one from Massachusetts and then one from Long Island. So they were used up and down the coast um, to the, basically uh, New Jersey, the Chesapeake, up to Maine. And they were special barge type boats that were very, had a very shallow draft. You weren't gonna worry about them getting stuck uh, in, a, in a mud basically that was in the uh, marsh. You can see both of these gundalos have sails, um, which most of them would have but smaller ones, or if you didn't have the money or whatever, you would just pole it. Um, so you'd get another pole um, in addition to the poles you were using for your hay storage and stuff, a skinnier pole, and you would push yourself through the marsh, um, which wasn't very deep in most places. 
Okay. And here are some more scenes of them using uh, shallow draft boats um, and some animals and things. These are all from Long Island, and these are all early 1900s. Um, these actually were taken around the Carmen's River, which is where there's a national wildlife refuge um, called Wertheim, um, which is a beautiful place, a big marsh down there on the south shore of Long Island. Um, a cool fact that I stumbled across was that the early settlers of that area were from Connecticut, and they didn't have a great concept of um, water flow or science, apparently, because they named the Carmen's River the Connecticut River because they thought it, it flowed underneath Long Island Sound and was fed that way, which is kind of a, an interesting belief. Um, when they realized that was not true, they renamed it the Carmen's River. And the reason why people are so, one of the reasons why people are so fascinated with this stuff even today, and why I've been asked to give this presentation, I think, is because this act of haymaking in salt marshes became something that popped up time and time again in popular culture, basically, in art, uh, postcards, and things like that. So I've got some examples of that. Uh, it basically became romanticized. And I would love to see this uh, painting in real life. It's called Newburyport Meadows. And that's an area, again, in Massachusetts, um, where there is another National Wildlife Refuge, um, Parker River. Um, that area that becomes synonymous with uh, salt marsh haymaking, even today, that's where you get it from. Um, so this is a beautiful picture of that. You can see the farmers in the middle and then the stacks there, and it looks so real to me. And then there are a lot of postcards, as I mentioned, from uh, all along the Connecticut shore. This is an example from Lyme. Uh, there are examples from Westbrook um, and other places, I'm sure Guilford and Branford. Um, this was certainly done, so there may be postcards from there. So these places become um, known for this sort of beautiful scene, simple, um, you know, living off the land type scene in the early 20th century. And another obvious example, uh, especially from the Lyme, old Lyme area, is all of these artists who painted um, because of basically the, the hospitality of people like Florence Griswold. So these American Impressionists um, painted lots of different scenes of uh, the rivers, the marshes, and a lot of them have either hay uh, stacked up or in the case of the, the one on the top left there, the farmer working the hay in the marsh with his oxen and cart there. So very popular um, for a time for making art postcards and it still kind of lives on despite the many generations that have passed us. So eventually salt marsh haymaking uh, declines. So what brings upon this decline? Well, it's a lot of different things. Here, there's a lot of text on the, the screen there. Um, basically, I'll, I'll summarize it. So they're talking about great meadows that I've referred to a, a couple of times here. Uh, the tract of a thousand acres that has creeks and other things. Um, and this gentleman here refers to it um, with a rank growth of salt grass. Um, in the past, this grass has been gathered and found a market of indifferent character, packing and bedding, brought only $8 a ton. So basically he's um, bemoaning the fact that these farmers are wasting this land because they're only using it for um, harvesting salt hay which in his 20th century mind is pretty useless. And he wants to maybe fill it in a little bit with more soil. 
and he wants to plant crops like sweet corn, celery, and asparagus. This is an article from, I think, 1906. Um, so this plants the seed of this land is, is kind of useless. It's not even land, it's wet. Why are we wasting it? We need to kind of fill it in, use it for better purposes. Um, so farmers may or may not do that, but uh, it starts waning where um, livestock need this or we need this for, for anything. And then you, if you've spent any time in marshes, you, you certainly see the evidence of these um, mechanically dug ditches today. So we talked about dikes um, that the farmers would have built. They dug ditches by hand. But in the 1930s, it became widespread across the country um, to ditch our marshes because we felt that they were just breeding grounds for mosquitoes. They were nothing better than a swamp. Um, and we should get rid of um, these breeding grounds of, of bugs and things like that. Um, and then unfortunately, a lot of government money went into this during the New Deal um, because the WPA and the CCC sponsored a lot of this ditching um, by hand, but also um, mechanically. And that's why a lot of the scars are still visible of these ditches. Um, 20th century salt marsh haymaking basically fades away um, in all of Connecticut. The last person to sell salt marsh hay in Connecticut that I know of lived in Stonington. Um, and he passed away about 10 years ago, I believe. Um, and he was, you know, up in years at that time. So I think around the year 2000 um, is, is when the last, um, you know, commercial salt marsh haymaking happened in Connecticut. I could be wrong, but nobody has corrected me on that. Um, the closest place that I know of where you can see this done and where you can still buy salt marsh hay is up in uh, Newberry, Massachusetts. So Newberry, Newberry Port, Plum Island, that area still has some farms that do this actively uh, and they sell it there. And I think you can order it and they, they ship it to certain places. Um, people who are into gardening uh, do seek salt marsh hay um, to spread around their garden because it's pretty beneficial as a, like a fertilizer to keep the weeds down. It doesn't have weed seeds in it. Um, that sort of thing. Uh, and this is a, a website and a Facebook page from another uh, salt marsh hay farm up in that area. And they, they still sell it. I, you can probably order it online if you really wanted to or call them. Um, so that I believe is the closest place that we still have of this uh, kind of ancient art of farming in our marshes. Um, the legacy of salt marsh haymaking. Well, is it all good? Unfortunately, it is not. Um, it didn't do as much damage to the marshes as that mechanical ditches, ditching, um, but there are some lasting negative impacts. So if you see the big picture on the screen there, there's still an old, pole uh, stuck in the marsh from when people farmed it there. Um, I don't know what it's made out of. It might be cedar if it has lasted that long. Um, and it is marking, uh, I believe, a hand dug ditch. At least that's what our salt marsh ecologist thought when she visited us last year. Um, so the other picture there is our salt marsh ecologist who's based in Maine with an intern and she's describing um, basically the, the changes in hydrology because of ditching these marshes. Um, so the farmers really before, more than we realized it, um, changed the hydrology, changed the elevation of a lot of these areas. 
through ditching and small dikes and moving soil, much more so than we thought. Um, and that wasn't so evident until fairly recently um, when areas of some parts of our marshes started dying off. Um, and the Spartina patents, the, the grass that the farmers were always interested in, wasn't able to regenerate itself as well. And the high marshes just didn't look very healthy. They, they patches of them look and still look like um, kind of wasteland. So a lot of this is still being affected by things that were done a couple hundred years ago. And what's happening now with rising um, sea level in some places and possibly accelerating over the next couple of de decades um, and temperature changes and things, the marshes aren't as resilient as they may have been uh, if people didn't uh, alter them. Um, so even though it, it, it's a cool practice to study um, and it's very interesting to learn about salt marsh haymaking, there, the practice actually still did leave a bit of a negative impact uh, on our marshes that we can see today if we know what to look for. And with that, that is the end of the presentation. Um, I will remind folks um, before taking questions that we do have a pretty active Facebook page for the refuge. Um, and we have a website, obviously, you can check out to find more information. You can visit a lot of these places with, um, for instance, the marsh that is the background image there, Salt Meadow, year round, um, anytime that you would like. And there's some cool stuff to see. Um, and there's some of the best preserved marshes left in Connecticut. So if folks do have any questions and, and Dennis can help um, moderate, maybe we can have some of those. Thanks, Sean. That was uh, fascinating, way more than uh, I knew about the use of uh, salt marshes for haymaking. Thank you. There was a, a question in the chat from uh, William. Do you want to uh, unmute yourself and ask your question, uh, William? Okay, so um, I live uh, near a salt marsh and there are still some ditches out there. Um, and I understand that I think um, somebody from deep uh, many years ago came and uh, dredged them out again. Um, that was before I moved here, but um, I live in Brantford. So um, in the, as you drive along Route 146, uh, towards Guilford, you can see the ditches clearly uh, still exist out there. Yeah. And I never really knew what they were um, um, and what purpose they served. Um, so the, the question remains in my mind, do we want to keep them open or do we let them fill in and uh, yeah. uh, let nature take its course? Yeah, it's a very good question. Um, in most cases, the ditches that you are, in almost all cases, the ditches that you are seeing were created around the period of the 30s um, and were either mechanically dug or dug by big teams of people uh, specifically for that purpose. So the, the ditches that the farmers would have dug for the most part weren't as deep, they weren't as uh, straight, and you can't see them too much anymore. So the ones that we see either, you know, just looking with our eyes or on a satellite image or something like that were dug for mosquito control. Now, I don't know a lot about mosquito control or the science behind that in the 30s. Um, I do know that there, the science behind it wasn't very good. Um, because it, it didn't really work very well, if at all, um, to control mosquito breeding. Um, but that was the idea behind it. So you would get um, 
you, I, you would eliminate some of the places for breeding of, of mosquitoes. Um, I don't think that they really understood that very well though. And it, it, hasn't, it hasn't done anything for that. And what it has done is just basically screw up the hydrology of these marshes, um, make them less resilient. And for, for deep to come in and remove some uh, material from a ditch to keep it open, I would think that that would be the exception. Usually we don't touch the dish, ditches, um, but in most cases, the thinking is that if we do anything about them, it would be to fill them in and to create a more natural um, marsh. When, whether the, the ditch was dug by farmers a, a hundred years ago or, um, or, or more than that, uh, or people, you know, from the WPA in the 30s. Um, the more natural the marsh is, uh, is, is better. Um, but that's not always the case. So maybe the state had some reasoning behind uh, clearing out some ditches in a certain area, um, but it's not the usual practice. Thank you. Yeah. Stephanie, you wanna come on? Here we go. Um, it's the same question. So I think Sean already answered it. What was the purpose of them digging those, uh, you know, those canals or those ditches? Um, I, I mean, not the purpose. How did how did it work? How did it control mosquitoes? But you, you, you answered that or, or attempted to answer that question already. Yes. Yeah. My answer, the only answer I can give is that it, it didn't. And I haven't researched what they thought it was going to do. Um, but I, I should actually look that up to see if there was any research around it. But. Well, it's interesting. Um, I live on the West River in New Haven. And in 1919, I believe I have the right year, they put in tide gates um, at the mouth of the West River so that salt water wouldn't come into the river. And the thinking was, that in fact, that also would control mosquitoes and it didn't do a thing. Right, yes, yeah. Yeah, they, I think a lot of it honestly was e experimentation, um, but they did an awful lot of manipulation to experiment on something that didn't work. <laughs> Jenny and or John, you wanna uh, make your point? I was just going to say that um, in in South Jersey along Delaware Bay there are, are extensive uh, former salt hay farms, and when the fodder business uh, died, there were a lot of uh, glass factories in South Jersey that were still using the salt hay as a packing material for the glass products that they shipped uh, out all over the country. Uh, yeah. If you have Google Maps, you can look around uh, Morris River, that area. And from Morris River West, there are huge, just huge areas of marsh uh, right. along Delaware Bay that were used and uh, they used uh, horses and they used the same equipment you talked about, Sean, with the, uh, the special shoes for the horses. Right. And uh, my wife and I were down there years ago and uh, it's like being in another world. You can you drive out there at the end of the road and uh, it seems like you're, you can look for miles and you still can't see the bay. Right. Uh, because the grass is just so thick and so heavy. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful area. Yeah, yes, yeah, good point. Oh, just exquisite, exquisite. I just, I can't, I can't say enough about it. Yeah, I'll have to check that area out. Um, I did not know that specifically about South Jersey and um, using that for the glass industry, but it, it totally makes sense. Um, that they would do that it was a common 
common thing before um, that. And there, there are, I don't know if the area you're specifically talking about um, is part of it, but there, there are national wildlife refuges down there that are mostly marshes that are huge protected areas. Um, so yeah, here in Connecticut, everything's kind of on the smaller scale um, compared to places like that or up in Newbury, Massachusetts. Um, but yeah, it's cool. I'll have to check that out if I go down there. Well, of course, there is the Brigantine National Wildlife um, Refuge, which mm -hmm. is huge. Just yeah, and you can see Atlantic City from from there. But it it seems like it's another world away. Right. Yeah. Because it's just desolate, except for the. It's a wonderful birding parrot. We saw our first flock of brant down at. Uh, Brigantine, huh, many, okay. many years ago. Mm -hmm. Thank you, John. Spencer. Wanna, Hi, good evening. Oh. Spencer Meyer here. I, uh, I live near Leaks Island, near a lot of salt marsh in Guilford. I also happen to be the president of the Guilford Land Trust, um, and we own a lot of salt marshes in the area. And uh, I want to thank okay. you for your presentation and all your work and Monongatuck sure. Society as well for all their work in partnership with us, so thank you. Uh, my question is about um, these little U-shaped wooden structures that we see in some of the areas. They look like maybe they were the footings for plank walks at one point. They're not the tall poles you were showing in your pictures. They're quite a bit shorter than that, and they have okay. a cross brace on them. Do you have any idea what those are? Do you, can you think of what I'm talking about? You know, I, I don't uh, offhand know what those would be. Um, I'll have to take a look or, or email some folks who may know. Um, they could be related to harvesting of salt hay. Um, do they entirely wood or do they have some hardware attached to them or? No, they're, they're in the middle of a salt marsh that is largely flooded. So, um, okay. So I can't see them up close, but they look like if you're going to build a, a, a boardwalk and you'd have like two vertical posts and then a cross piece that went on top with decking, for example, um, they look like that would have been. Uh, okay. Someone says they're from the trolley line. They look a lot narrower than the other trolley bit um, pieces I've seen, but that is a possibility. I hadn't thought about that. Okay, yeah. I don't know, yeah. but that's interesting. I'll have to see if anybody I know is familiar with that. Thank you for that idea, Chris. Good point. One thing about the trolley line, though, you could check is what direction do they go? Do they go the direction that the trolley line would have gone? Or could they be, could they have been plank, uh, uh, part of a boardwalk system to get out to where they would be harvesting the hay? Yeah. Worth following up on. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Uh, if so, uh, you can uh, unmute yourself and ask. You're welcome. I guess there are no other questions. So, Sean, thank you so very much for uh, this fascinating presentation. Sure. And, uh, thank all of you people who attended. Check uh, the Manukatuk website calendar for the upcoming events. As I said, the next one is the Blackbirders Walk, Blackbirders Week Walk on uh, the first Thursday in June, June 2nd. With that, uh, have a good evening, everyone, and uh, take care. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Have a good night. Thank you very much. Great presentation. Thanks. You're welcome.